In our last section, we learned all about elements on the periodic table. And in this section, we are going to be learning about what happens when those elements on the periodic table get together and make compounds. The cool thing is, is some of the things that we learned about in the last section, for example, valence electrons, how many valence electrons an element has, does it have one, does it have two, does it have six, does it have seven, really is what determines what type of a compound it's going to form and how it's going to form that compound. So lesson four is called types of bonds. In this section, we're going to be talking about how electrons are involved in bond formation, what types of bonds form between atoms, and then how do bonds determine certain properties of compounds. On page 368 and 369, the connected question that you need to answer is, is we got this cool picture of a fingerprint here. In the diagram, it says the elements that make up cyanoacrylate undergo chemical changes to form the compound. So when you read about the compound, it'll tell you what that does for us. Obviously, you can see it's involved somewhat in helping detect fingerprints, but read a little bit about it, and then after you're done reading about it, answer that question, how does cyanoacrylate uh, compare to the elements that make it up? That is a compound. So the elements that make it up, how is that compound different than the elements that make it up. Remember, we talked about this um, with sodium chloride. So sodium chloride, sodium, soft, silvery, reactive metal, chlorine, green toxic gas come together and make table salt, sodium chloride that we put on our food every day. So kind of keep that in mind. Remember that what happens when those elements get together and make compounds. We have different types of bonding depending upon what happens with those valence electrons. Remember, most elements are neutral. So we're going to have the same number of protons and electrons. Neutrons being neutral, so remember for the charge, they're not going to count. But protons and electrons, if they're the same, it's going to give us a neutral charge, right? That positive and that negative is going to balance out. However, that's not always the case. If an atom or a group of atoms has a charge, can either have a positive charge or a negative charge, we call that an ion. So if something is charged, it is called an ion. Atom, atoms want to get full outer electron shells. Remember I kept talking about that when we talked about the periodic table, that's their goal in life. They want to get that full shell. So they're gonna do a few different things to get to that full shell depending upon how many valence electrons have. If they have, um, fewer number of valence electrons, think one, two, three, they are likely to get rid of them because it's a lot easier to get rid of one, two, or three electrons than it is to take seven, six, five electrons. So atoms that lose electrons become positive. And it seems a little bit silly, but when you think about it, it completely and totally makes sense. If I'm a particle and I'm losing negative particles, I'm going to become more positively charged. So when elements lose electrons, they form a positive ion, and that's because they have more protons than electrons, they become positively charged, more protons. And these are our metals. So think metals on the periodic table because they have likely one, two, or three valence electrons. It's way easier to just get rid of those few electrons, and they form a positive ion. On the other hand, on that right-hand side of the periodic table, remember our nonmetals have way more valence electrons. They're going to have six. They're going to have seven. So it's easier to take two, easier to take one electron to get to that full shell because remember, that's what all elements want. They want that full shell. So nonmetals are likely to gain electrons to get that full shell. And when they gain electrons, think about what you're doing. You're becoming more negatively charged. You're taking negative, negative, negative because you are taking those negative particles you become more negatively charged, those nonmetals are likely to form negative ions, and that's because they have more electrons than protons. So don't think about this in terms of math, like we get used to the whole positive negative thing in math. This has nothing to do with it. It actually has to do with charge. Do I have more pluses? Do I have more minuses? If I have more pluses, I'm gonna be positively charged. If I have more minuses, or negative charges, I'm going to be a negative ion.
first element on the far left hand side of this diagram here, this would be a neutral atom. I have the same number of protons and electrons. If I have six pluses, six negatives, that's going to be neutral. In the middle picture, if I have more electrons than protons, so as you can see here, it looks like I have six electrons, but five protons in the nucleus, so five pluses, six negatives, it's going to be negatively charged. And it's actually because it has one more negative than a positive, it's actually a minus one charge. Last picture on the far right hand side, more protons than electrons. So because I have more pluses than minuses, that's an example of a positively charged ion. And because I have one more plus than minuses, that would be what we call a plus one ion. So a plus one has one more proton than electrons. So if you look at the left hand diagram here for common ions and their charges, sodium plus one. That's what it likely forms because remember what we learned about sodium. Sodium has one valence electron. It's all it's got. So does potassium. So what they really like to do is get rid of that one electron and they form a plus one ion. And you can see how we write that. We make, we write an Na plus and a C plus. Um, in your notebook, will you please write underneath ions? Let's write an example. Um, Na plus and then K plus. Make sure to put those in your notes. That is going to be required. So let's see an example. Put in the notes Na plus K plus. If you see two plus next to one of these um, elements on the left hand side or one of these ions, that means that it lost two electrons. It has two more protons and electrons. So calcium being an alkaline earth metal has two valence electrons. So because it has two valence electrons, it likes to get rid of those two valence electrons forming a two plus ion. On the other hand, if you look down at the bottom, fluoride, chlorine, or chloride, those are elements that like to gain electrons. Remember they're halogens. They've got a um, seven valence electrons. So what they, they need is they just need that one electron. So when they take that one electron, they get their full shell because they have one more electron than protons, they form a minus one. If I have a two minus, then on the other hand, that would be two more electrons than protons, right? So that's what that number is telling you. Remember, don't think math, that's telling me charge. So make sure in your notes you have an Na plus, K plus, and then how about we also add on there a minus example. So why don't we add in chlorine? That's a really common one. Chlorine with a minus, and you'll notice we don't have a one behind it either, and we don't have it on the top. We like to do shorthand things in chemistry, so we don't write ones. If it's not necessary, you're not going to see that one there. Polyatomic ion, you just saw two examples on that chart there. You'll notice they look a little bit different. Polyatomic ion, that name polyatomic, many atoms, many atoms bonded together that have a charge. So great examples of polyatomic ions, we have ammonium, which is NH4+. Plus. Or remember, NH4 plus one, so that mean it means it has um, one more proton than it does electrons. But because it's a polyatomic ion, that charge applies to the entire group of atoms. That so that nitrogen and that those hydrogen, excuse me, that nitrogen and hydrogen atoms are bonded together. It's almost like it's a little package. So think of polyatomic ions like little packages that you can't break up. OH minus hydroxide. Um, that is an OH minus one. Nitrate, NO3 minus. Phosphate, PO4, three minus. Sulfate, SO4, two minus. So those are all polyatomic ions, many atoms bonded together, and that charge applies to the entire polyatomic ion, not just one of the elements in it, the entire thing. So in your book on page 370, we have um, an example of a compound forming here, how ions form. An atom that loses one of its electrons because it becomes a positively charged ion. The atom that gains the electron becomes a negatively charged ion. Examine the diagram that shows how potassium and fluorine become ions. So up here on the top, you can see potassium had one, fluorine had seven. So using our electron dot structures because potassium has one valence electron and fluorine has seven. So what happens is this potassium will give its electron to fluorine and it forms a plus one ion because it gave away one electron. Fluorine took one electron, forming a minus one ion. Potassium's happy, got rid of its extra electron. Fluorine's happy, got that extra electron. And I have this plus and this minus sitting by each other. 
And in nature, pluses and minuses like each other, so they stick together, forming that compound, the potassium and the fluorine. For the developing models, examine the diagram that shows how potassium and fluorine become ions. Then complete the electron dot diagrams for the ionization of calcium and oxygen. Calcium is an alkaline earth metal. So remember, it's going to have two valence electrons. So make sure when we're doing those dots, you have the one dot in one of those rectangles and then the other dot in the other one. Oxygen in the oxygen group is going to have six valence electrons. So starting with six. So think about what happens here. Calcium's got two. Oxygen's got six. Oxygen needs the two. Calcium wants to get rid of them. So calcium gets rid of those two electrons, forming a two plus ion. Oxygen takes those two electrons so it can get to its full eight, forming a minus two ion. And once again, you've got the plus and the minus sitting there. They like each other because opposites attract and they stick together and make a compound. So on page 370, you want to make sure that you are drawing your dots in there. Forming ionic bonds, a bond that forms when there is a transfer of electrons between elements. So what you guys just did from the book is literally formed ionic bonds. One element gave its electrons to another element. One became positive, one became negative. The negative ion is attracted to the positive ion. They stick together and make a compound. Ionic bonds or ionic compounds usually form when a metal and a nonmetal combine with each other, as we saw. Metals wanting to get rid of those electrons, nonmetals wanting to take them. We have previously learned about the formation of ions. Now we will learn about ionic bonds. Ions, as you already know, are formed from the loss or gain of electrons. Electrons, however, do not suddenly appear or disappear. They are, in fact, transferred from one atom to another. Let's look at sodium chloride as an example. Sodium loses one electron to form a sodium ion. The electron is not lost, but transferred to chlorine to form a chloride ion. So we have a sodium ion and a chloride ion. They are oppositely charged ions and will be electrostatically attracted to one another, much like how opposite poles of a magnet are attracted to one another. This electrostatic attraction is an ionic bond. Sodium chloride is an ionic compound because it is held intact by ionic bonds. The same thing happens with magnesium and oxygen. Why don't you grab a piece of paper and a pencil and draw the resulting ionic compound, magnesium oxide. Please pause the lesson and resume when you are done. Magnesium transfers its two valence electrons to oxygen, forming a magnesium ion and an oxide ion. The resulting ions are electrostatically attracted to one another, forming an ionic bond. Did you get this right? Did you remember to include the charges on the ion? Now, let's look at calcium and chlorine. Calcium loses two electrons to form a calcium ion. One of these electrons is transferred to a chlorine atom, and another is transferred to another chlorine atom, forming two chloride ions. The calcium ion is electrostatically attracted to the two chloride ions because the opposite charges must fully balance each other out. In all three examples, the resulting ionic compounds have an overall neutral charge because all charges are fully balanced out. In summary, an ionic bond is defined as the electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. When an ionic compound is formed, the charges must be balanced so that the resulting ionic compound has an overall neutral charge. So we want to make sure we keep in mind there, ionic compounds, one element's positively charged, one is negatively charged, and they're getting together making that compound because of that ionic charge. All right, in your book on page 371, Formation of an Ionic Bond, Follow the steps to see how an ionic bond forms between a sodium atom and a chlorine atom. 
complete the electron dot diagrams for the sodium and chlorine atoms in their ions. Write a statement that shows how the charge on an ion relates to the number of electrons transferred. How are they the same? What does the charge tell you about the number of electrons transferred? The sodium atom has one valence electron. The chlorine atom has seven. So in the picture on page 371 for number one, you should be drawing in one dot for sodium. And they just told us without having to get our periodic table, chlorine is going to have seven. The valence electron of the sodium atom is transferred to the chlorine atom. So sodium gives its electron to chlorine. The sodium atom becomes a positive Na plus. The chlorine atom becomes a negative Cl minus. Particles with opposite charges attract, so the positive sodium ion and the negative chlorine ion attract. Positives and negatives attract, forming that ionic bond. The resulting compound is called an, an ionic compound. It is made up of positive and negative ions. In an ionic compound, the total positive charge of all the positive ions equals the total negative charge of all the negative ions. So as you saw in the video, we need to make sure that the overall charge is neutral. So these atoms or these elements will keep combining until it is a neutral. Sometimes you need two atoms of a certain element. Sometimes you need one. For example, as we saw earlier, oxygen has six. Sodium only has one. So if sodium gives oxygen an electron, oxygen still wouldn't have eight. It needs to get to that eight. So it would take another sodium atom. So you would, when, you, when you do that, you're going to get that balancing out of the positives and the negatives. Our other type of bonds that can form are covalent bonds. So forming covalent bonds. That prefix co means share. If you're the co of anything, if you're the co-chair of a committee, it means you share that responsibility with someone else. And look at what other word is in there, valent. So sharing valent electrons. Covalent bonds are bonds that form when elements share electrons. So instead of one element giving the other element electrons, like we saw with ionic, they decide, hey, I need some, you need some, why don't we just share and then we'll both be happy. So in a covalent bond, electrons go around all atoms they share. These are the type of bonds that usually form between nonmetals. So when nonmetals get together and make compounds, so remember elements, upper right hand side, part of the periodic table, when they get together and make compounds, this is usually what happens. So think of our elements that we had up there, like carbon, sulfur, oxygen, nitrogen. So they like to form covalent bonds. Covalent bonds. In this video, you are going to learn about covalent bonds, how they are made, and how they form. If you haven't seen it already, first have a look at our video, Structure and Bonding. Only the noble gases exist naturally as single atoms. All the other elements of the periodic table have partially filled valence shells, or outer electron shells. Atoms bond by swapping or sharing electrons in their outer shells. When very different atoms react, like metals and nonmetals, they normally swap electrons. This is ionic bonding. But when similar atoms react, like nonmetals combining with other nonmetals, they share electrons. This is covalent bonding. Nonmetals are found on the right hand side and upper part of the periodic table. Some common nonmetals are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and the halides. They have shells of electrons that are normally half or more than half full of electrons. Since they have a strong attraction for a few additional electrons, it is energetically unfavourable for them to lose electrons, so they share electrons by overlapping orbitals. This makes a bonding orbital, or covalent bond, that contains two electrons. If there is space in the outer shell, a non-metal atom can form double or triple bonds, like in oxygen or nitrogen.
In the displayed formula of a compound, we represent a covalent bond with a straight line, like this. We can also represent a covalent bond as a dot and cross diagram. These diagrams show only the valence electrons. To learn more about dot and cross diagrams, watch our video on dot and cross diagrams. Covalent bonds are directional, which means they are in a fixed position, like holding hands. This is different from ionic bonds, which are formed with an electrostatic attraction between charged ions. The overlap between orbitals means that the atoms in covalent bonds are very close. These things make covalent bonds strong. There are two kinds of covalent structure, small molecules like water and giant compounds like diamond. Because the electrons in the bonds are evenly shared, bonds are not polarised. There is little attraction between molecules and forces between molecules are weak. Compounds made from small covalent molecules have low melting and boiling points and are volatile. They also don't conduct electricity. Carbon and silicon tend to form giant covalent compounds. These bond in the same way, but instead of forming small molecules with one or two bonds, they form four, making up huge lattices or chains of many, many linked up atoms, the basis of the organic chemistry of carbon or the chemistry of rocks. One common example is diamond, which is made of carbon. Each carbon atom forms four covalent bonds because it has four electrons in its outer shell to share and has space for four more. If every carbon atom forms four bonds with four other carbon atoms and each of these forms four bonds with four other carbon atoms and each of these forms four bonds, we very quickly end up with a very large structure. These compounds have very high melting and boiling points because you have to break covalent bonds rather than intermolecular forces to make them free enough to act as liquids or gases. The covalent bonds hold them rigidly in place in the giant lattice. Allotropes of non-metals bond covalently. Allotropes are different structures of the same element. You can learn more about these in our video, Allotropes of Non-Metals. So to finish, here is a challenge for you. Which of these compounds are covalent? Pause the video for a moment whilst you think. Have you considered their physical properties and where the elements come from on the periodic table? Solved it? OK. The answer is all of these compounds are covalent. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and methanol are all small molecules. Organic molecules form covalent bonds between hydrogen and carbon. C70 is a fullerene, a carbon molecule shaped like a rugby ball, closely related to the Buckminster fullerene. Silicon dioxide is a giant covalent structure, and just like diamond, but has oxygen atoms bridging between four coordinate silicon atoms. Hopefully, you now feel confident identifying covalent compounds and recognising their properties. So covalent bonds, when those elements get together and form our covalent compounds with covalent bonds where they're sharing electrons, we call their basic building part or basic building block a molecule. So a molecule is a neutral group of atoms joined by covalent bonds. So water is an example of a covalent compound. You have hydrogen and oxygen share electrons forming that covalent compound. This on the slide you would see would be an example of one molecule of water. So that is a molecule of a covalent compound. On page 372, number of bonds sharing electrons. By sharing two electrons in a covalent bond, each bromine atom gains a stable set of eight valence electrons. So they don't always need to share one, one pair. They can share two pairs if they want, and sometimes they can even share three pairs.
Circle the shared electrons that form a covalent bond between the two bromine atoms. So you can see we have two bromine atoms coming together here because they're sharing. If they didn't share, they would each have seven, but when then they share, then now they get to that eight. So on that picture where you see the bromine, you should be circling the pair of electrons that are being shared. In figure six, atoms can form single, double, and triple covalent bonds by sharing one or more pairs of electrons. What type of covalent bond forms between two nitrogen atoms? Is it a single, double, or triple bond? Which one is it? So you can see some examples here. We have a single bond example. So hydrogen and sulfur, both nonmetals. Hydrogen's got one, sulfur has six. So if I share one pair with the hydrogen atom, that hydrogen would be happy, great, but the sulfur would not because the sulfur needs to get up to eight, remember. So if I bring in another hydrogen atom, then now everyone is happy. Both of those hydrogens are happy. They got their two that they need to fill that first shell, and then sulfur is going to have eight. So this compound, actually what it looks like is called H2S. So hydrogen sulfide, H2S, and that's what that's going to look like. Oxygen, so the oxygen you are breathing in right now, O2, Oxygen has six, remember, six valence electrons. So if they just shared one pair, it wouldn't be enough. They would have seven. So when they share two pairs and form that double bond, then oxygen is happy. Nitrogen has five. So remember nitrogen having five. If I share one pair, I'm not going to get to enough. But if I share three pairs forming that triple bond, then it will be enough. Now, just like in life, if we all want to share things equally, that would be magical, but that is not what happens. And the same thing happens in nature with elements that share electrons. Not all electrons are shared equally. So in covalent bonds, electrons are not always shared equally. In this case, we say that that bond is a polar bond. So polar bonds, electrons are not shared equally in a covalent bond. And the reason we call it a polar bond is because one side is more positively charged and one side is more negatively charged. So positive side, negative side. Water is the best example of that. The oxygen atom likes to hog those electrons. And so because it likes to hog those electrons, it forms a minus. And then the hydrogens form um, a plus side to the molecule because they don't get the electrons as much. And the fact that water is a polar molecule really affects a lot of things in nature. Um, if you've ever put a drop of water on a table before and you notice how it sort of bubbles over, that's literally the reason why. Because all of those water molecules, the negative lines up with the positive side, lines up with the negative side, lines up with the positive, and they line up like little tiny magnets and essentially kind of stick together. So how about in your notebook, why don't you go ahead and draw that water molecule. So let's draw, take your, take your time here to do a little bit of an, do the H2O and draw one side. The oxygen side is going to be negative. And then the hydrogen side is going to be positive. Now, sometimes they do share equally. When they do share equally, we say that they have a nonpolar bond or they form a nonpolar compound. So electrons are shared equally in a covalent bond. So carbon dioxide, for example, when you are exhaling carbon dioxide, CO2, they do share equally. So you don't have a positive side to the molecule. You don't have a negative side like you do with the water molecules. So on page 374, then nonpolar and polar molecules. So polar, remember, one side's positive, one side's negative. Both carbon dioxide and water molecules contain polar bonds. However, only water is a polar molecule. Draw a positive sign next to the atoms that gain a slight positive charge, and we just saw those in the picture. Draw a negative sign next to the atoms that gain, gain a slight negative charge. So make sure in both of those pictures you are drawing that properly. For the reading check, why can a molecule containing polar bonds be nonpolar overall? Just think about that electron sharing that we just talked about. If a balloon is rubbed on your hair, it gains electrons and becomes negatively charged. When these charges come close to a stream of water, the stream of water bends, just like you see in the picture there. Use what you know about polar molecules to explain why the bending occurs. So it looks like that water is liking that balloon. So think what's going on there that is making that water become attracted to the balloon. Properties of compounds. So we talked about bonding, our ionic and our covalent bonds. The compounds that form from them have very specific traits like we saw in the video. So ionic compounds are going to have hard, brittle crystals, and they're going to have really high melting points. Ionic binding is really strong, so it's really hard to split them up. So you got to get a really high melting point to get them to split up.
ionic compounds when dissolved in water will actually conduct electricity. Those ions will split up and it is a great medium for transporting electricity. So as you can see in figure nine, the ions and ionic compounds are arranged in specific three dimensional shapes called crystals. So we will say ionic compounds have a crystalline structure to them. Some crystals have a cubic shape like these crystals of quicklime or calcium oxide. Covalent compounds exist as molecules. Remember we saw that earlier. So also known as molecular compounds. So when you see the, the verbiage molecular compounds, it's telling you that is a covalent compounds. Now these bonds are not as strong. So because of that, covalent compounds have much lower melting points. They also do not conduct heat or electricity as well as ionic compounds. On page 376, there's a math toolbox that you need to do. Uh, the table shows the melting and boiling points of a few molecular compounds and ionic compounds. So it looks like we have five different compounds there. They give us the formula. You can use those instead of writing names on the bottom if you want, because that makes our life easier. Paying attention to capital and lowercase letters. And then we have melting points and boiling points. Complete the bar graph below by drawing five bars showing the melting points of the compounds in the table. Arrange the bars in order of increasing melting points. Label each bar with the chemical formula of the compound. So it says in order of increasing melting points. So we wanna have the compound with the lowest melting point on the far left hand side. So it looks like according to our picture here, that would be minus 88.5 degrees Celsius. Um, our isopropyl alcohol, C3H8O, that compound would be on the far left-hand side until I go all the way over to the right-hand side, and then I would have, would have sodium chloride with 800.7 degrees Celsius. For question number two, when you are finished making your bar graph, remember, label each bar with the chemical formula of the compound. Circle the correct answer. Ammonia, NH3, has a melting point of minus 78 degrees Celsius, in a boiling point of minus 34 degrees Celsius. This data suggests that ammonia is a which one? So you should be circling, is it a molecular or an ionic compound? And think about what we just said, right? Remember we said ionic compounds have really high melting points because that crystalline structure is so strong. You also need to answer the question on 376. A compound has a melting point of 812 degrees Celsius. What type of bonding do you think this is? Is it going to be Ionic or covalent? Does that seem like a high melting point to you? If it does, it would be ionic, correct? If it's a lower one, it's going to be covalent. Last thing that we're going to do is our lesson check on page 377. Looks like uh, number one, remember polyatomic ions, many atoms bonded together. The important thing is, is they have a charge. Remember they have a charge. For number three, you draw an electron dot diagram to illustrate why noble gases are unreactive. So pick one of the noble gases, draw its electron dot diagram, and it says do not use helium. Um, anything else in there, go ahead and you're going to need to do a little bit of a description. Why is that element then not going to form a compound? Number four, predict whether carbon dioxide or water would have a higher bo boiling point. So carbon dioxide, CO2 and then water being H2O, which one would have a higher boiling point? Explain your prediction in terms of the attraction between molecules. If you need to read a little bit more in the book or do a little bit of extra research, you're gonna to need to do that. Use the periodic table to determine the number of valence electrons in hydrogen and in iodine, then draw an electron dot diagram showing the polar covalent bond that they form. So number five, it is polar, so they're gonna be sharing. So remember going back to our examples that had sharing of electrons, sharing, so we're using dots, and then circling, circling those using the correct number of valence electrons.